following interview was conducted with Carolyn Moo, the Martin J. Gillian uh, Dean at the Mendoza College of Business and the Ray Milan Sigurd Professor of Entrepreneurial Studies and former professor at, that's at Notre Dame University and former professor of management at Purdue University for the uh, Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, May 14, 2010, Stewart Center. Good morning, and Carolyn. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Um, I was born in Hong Kong. I was the fifth of six children, um, the fourth of four daughters of my parents. I was born in 1954. Um, I was educated by American missionary nuns, the Marinar sisters, from 1 through 12. Okay. Can you tell us about what school was like, high school, uh, any classes or organizations that you belong to? Um, high school was an absolute uh, formative years for me because we were taught by American nuns. Um, they had a different vision for girls. Um, they really believed that girls can do whatever they wanted to do, uh, which is kind of unusual in a Chinese culture. Uh, some of the formative experiences is that they uh, organized debate teams, um, and uh, he, they had us debating English-speaking boys. Um, I would say that was the most important experience I had, debate, and we also very strong faith formation activities, so I was involved in uh, uh, young Christian students, YCS, and student government. Uh, high school was very busy but very happy, and most important, it gave me the type of, I think, um, courage to go into new situations. Very good, okay. Then I guess the next thing was would be college. What brought you and then you came? Go yeah, ahead. I started at Purdue in 1972. Um, I applied from Hong Kong where I did not know much about American universities, except that I wanted to go to one. Um, I have seen a lot of television programs featuring Americans. I thought there was just a lot of uh, wonderful attitudes and full of adventures. So I wanted to come to the U.S. My father was against it. Um, I would go to the United States Information Services office in Hong Kong and read up on the schools, but of course catalogs had a lot of scores. And so I was helping my sister out one Saturday morning where she worked, which was TWA. There was a Purdue professor, Ursochek, I believe he was an economist, who was on leave and at the TWA office. He told me to apply to Purdue, and that's what got me here. <laughs> and you came? I okay, came. Okay. Tell us a little about undergrad and campus. Tell us a little about that. Um, I came to Purdue with only one year of funding, and uh, just because I collected these from my siblings and from my own savings, my father was against the idea. So because I had only one year of funding, I decided to do a lot. I signed up for a lot of classes. Um, I think I signed up for 24 credit hours and would, in the end, end up with 21 every semester. And I took everything I could fit into my schedule, uh, from Russian to even theology courses offered through St. Tom's. Um, at first, I was uh, very homesick. Uh, my dorm was Meredith Hall. I think I cried every day when I got up. Um, but after a month, things were fine, and I really started enjoying learning and the opportunity just to be exposed to all of this material. And I would say my friends in the residence hall at Meredith um, really sort of helped me get over my homesickness. And I had, there was a uh, RA, a residence assistant. Uh, her name was Kathy. Um, and she was a master's student in English, and she really understood that I was going through a tough time and reached out to me. So uh, I also had a faculty member who was my counselor in the humanities. Um, at that point, I had not decided on business yet, um, and uh, his name was Dr. Glenn Griffin. He and his wife just took me in, and. Uh, Whenever it was my birthday, they would organize a little party. When they thought that I was homesick, they would take me to Horticulture Park and took me for ice cream afterwards. So my first year, I made it through uh, with a lot of help from different people. Very good. What did you do? To, did you go home for that in the summer? No, um, I didn't have money to go home. Uh, but uh, at the end of my first year, I received a scholarship. And that was critical. Uh, the international student office at that point, they, there was not a lot of 
uh, full scholarships for international undergraduate students. There were only two. Um, and I remember Dr. Titchener um, and Mrs. Malady, who was his assistant. I applied to get one of those scholarships, um, and I got it. So I actually signed up for summer school, um, but I did have a little m money left over, so I went to London, where my sister was living. I went to visit her and her husband, and she actually had a miscarriage while I was there, and I was able to be uh, with her. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And then uh, go on from there. So then four years and then... We'll so um, I came back, but because I had 40-some credit hours after my first year, and my scholarship was for another three years, I decided that I would just finish really quickly so that I could uh, get a master's. So after my undergraduate in three years, I applied to the PhD program and you know, felt pretty good about having an, a year of funding left. Uh, but it turned out that I was accepted into the PhD program. I didn't need my extra year of funding from the undergraduate program. Uh, so I went into the PhD program in an area that nobody has ever heard of at that point, and it was called strategic management. So by now it was 1975, and my professors met with me, particularly Dr. Arnie Cooper. He probably took a look and said she was so young that she know what she's getting into and why she wants a PhD. And he answers, no, I didn't know why people got a PhD except that I was accepted. So they actually say, why don't you go through the one-year MSIA program? So that's what I did, 75 to 76. Um, I got my MSIA program, and then I finished my PhD in 1979 in strategic management. Wow. Well, tell us what, the, what that uh, was. What was the nature of the research? The research? Um, the, that was a very new field at that point. Strategic management really looks at um, how do organizations succeed, uh, particularly in light of the fact that uh, the environment changes. And what you used to do well yesterday and helped you succeed doesn't mean that you could succeed on the same formula tomorrow. And so it's about the alignment of organizations with the environment um, and how to be effective in the context of change. My specific research uh, was to study uh, small competitors. We know that large competitors, particularly market leaders, tend to have a lot of clout, and they tend to be more profitable. So I was curious about the smaller competitors. How do they survive? Because in every market, there could only be one market leader, whereas there were many sort of market followers. So my research was about how do these small, low market share businesses uh, flourish? What are the strategies that they should have? And I have to say, too, along the way, because I was here from 72 to 79, um, I also uh, met a young man who eventually became my husband. Uh, we met at church at St. Thomas Aquinas Center in the spring of 1973. Uh, I was a freshman. He was working on his master's in engineering at that point. And also in 1979, when I finished my PhD, we also got married. Very good. Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Then what came after you got your, you finished your doctorate, then what came next? Um, after I finished my doctorate, my husband by then was working in Cleveland, um, and uh, I wanted to go into industry. I didn't want an academic career at that point because clearly I have never worked outside of a university setting. I came in 72 as a freshman, and by now I'm 79. I spent seven years on a campus. And the field of study I have is about companies, but I've never set foot exactly. in a company office. So my first job, I decided that I wanted to go into industry, and I worked with General Motors um, in Ohio just to be close to my husband. I did that for about six months. Um, my major professor had by then referred um, a consulting firm to me. Um, and so I, after six months, left General Motors and worked as an assistant to the chairman um, of the consulting firm called the Strategic Planning Associates. So I did that for a year and a half, and at that point decided that I really missed academic life, and I was ready to return to the university. I felt like I had some really important and useful experience to draw on 
And so in 1981, we made a decision for me to return to the university as a faculty member. Okay, and you came to the Craner School. Right. Okay, right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about there. Um, I, w w this is a nice quote. My hope for education is not a desire for more information, but the opportunity to engage more fully in life and work. Nicely said. Um, very nice. So talk a little bit about your teaching and the research and things in, in the Craner School. And so I went back to the Craner School, and my field of study again is strategic management, which is about the question of um, how do firms survive, and how do they change, and how do they adapt. Uh, that question meant a lot to me because I came from Hong Kong, where there were dramatic changes. Um, Hong Kong in 1997 would go back to uh, the Chinese government uh, from the British government. So we think about communism, we think about free market. I mean, what a contrast. So I always took that to heart, and that is we need to be ready for change. Um, we need to accept change and not just hold on to the past because we are afraid of the future. Um, and so that was an underlying passion of me that I took into my teaching. Uh, I learned about teaching from Arnie Cooper, who was just an extremely skilled instructor. So I learned how to organize, and we teach by the case method, not by lecture, just because these problems tend to be open-ended. There's no right answer, but there's a certain framework you use for thinking. Um, and so I learned how to do the case method, watching Arnie Cooper, and of course, having been his student at one time. And I took that into the classroom. I developed a lot of different courses along the way. Um, I developed courses on um, operation strategy. Uh, I worked on cross-functional teams. I developed courses on structures and systems. Um, I have a module on uh, issues that middle managers face. And I would say I enjoyed all of those because all of those problems are very real to me. Right, good point, okay. Um, did you do mentoring, you mentored students? Uh, I mentored students. I had a number of PhD students who were working with me. Um, I would say that, again, I learned mentoring from Arnie Cooper and from Dan Schendel. They have very different styles. Arnie was extremely nurturing, um, and uh, he would actually sometimes, I think, um, do more work for the students than they deserve. Uh, when they didn't write well, he would you know, uh, do the revisions on their behalf. Um, Arnie was different in the sense that he always challenged students uh, to go beyond the comfortable. He challenged students to go beyond the incremental. Uh, so both of them were on my committee. Um, and uh, as a result, I learned to mentor other students based on those two people. Uh, one is that you have to give them confidence. Uh, you have to recognize that their skills are developing, but they're not totally there. Uh, but on the other part of it, too, is to balance that nurturing with challenge. Good combination, right. Um, we have, I have now a number of students who are chair professors. Very good. And very you, good And scores. you keep in touch with them. Yes, Isn't I that do. nice? Yes. That's wonderful. That's your, um, the director of the professional master's program, let's talk a little about that. Um, I was asked to run the professional master's program um, immediately after I made full professor. And of course, I had graduated from that program myself. Um, and so, and I was a faculty member. And I'm also a strategist. You know, you think about how do organizations survive? Well, the program is an example. Um, and so I had a personal, clearly, a bond to that particular program. I always felt like there were different things we could do better and how we resolve certain issues. At that point, um, IU was already in the top 20. And people believed that there could not be two programs from Indiana in the top 20, and I just didn't buy that. Um, I thought, no, we're just gonna give it a try. Um, I also had a good sense of how Purdue was different from the other schools, um, and so, and that's a strategist, by the way's approach, is to look for distinctive advantage. So I did take over the uh, master's program, the professional master's programs. I think I worked on it for two years, and it broke into the top 20. Very good. We're talking about rankings, and that, that's, 
that has really taken the fore over the last, what, really since U.S. News came up with it. And They've this always been there, but it's, it's more out there. At the yeah, I would say it's really a phenomenon, yeah. you know, more than 15 years old, but not quite 20 years old, right. uh, where rankings became very dominant. Oh, very much so, right. And they look in the book and things of that sort. Now, the uh, next thing was the Associate Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Ringel. Um, and he is quoted as saying, she's an example of somebody willing to put her expertise to work for us internally. That was in a newspaper article, and Dr. Yes. Baring announced that. Uh, Dr. Ringo, and I go back a long ways, um, I still miss him today uh, very, very much. When he was dean of Hissey, my husband was a graduate student in his office, so it was that long ago. So let's just say that was in the mid 70s sure. all right um, and then when I became a young faculty member at Cranert uh, his wife Estelle was the secretary to Dr. Cooper and me so she knew me from that setting um, and so I became a full professor I believe uh, in 1990 about 1990 or 1991, before I was asked to, be, to run the professional master's program, Dr. Ringo actually recruited me, interviewed me, to become an associate executive vice president. Um, I think at that point, I was a full professor for four months. Um, I have no idea what a full professor did. I have, definitely have no idea what the provost's office did. Um, he asked me to go interview. I thought it was a joke. Um, so I showed up for the interview. When he offered me the job at that point, I thought, my gosh, this is real. Uh, and then I remember I thought, oh, I don't think I would be good for that job. I have no idea what people do. And besides, I also by then was asked to run the MBA program at Cranard. And I thought I owed Cranard a debt. So I remember writing a note to Dr. Ringo and said, or maybe I called him and say, oh, Dr. Ringo, you don't really want me. I'm not very good. I don't know these things that you probably need me to do. You need someone better than me. Um, you deserve someone better than me. And I remember that night running into him at Stewart Center, there was a performance and at the intermission, he took me aside and he said, Carolyn, I just want you to know, I understand that you're not ready to come into my office. And he said, but you need to leave it to me to know whether you're qualified or not qualified. I know what you have done. I know what you have not done. And he said, today, a good friend of mine, he said, just committed suicide. And I'm not in any mood for any bullshit. Uh, you are very good, and I want you to tell me when you're ready. And that was a, an extremely important conversation because no one has ever talked to me with that much candor. And just even though it was an exchange of no more than five or six minutes, it said a lot of different things. He got right through. He got right through. Uh, to me, and he basically asked me to trust him, and my Chinese way was always to sort of put yourself down, particularly when rejecting a job offer, <laughs> is to take yourself down some more notches. <laughs> so I went into the um, uh, professional master's program, and then after two years, after we went into the top 20, there were a number of things that happened at Cranard, so I decided that I was ready um, to uh, change. I was ready to leave Cranard. And then I would either leave Cranard um, for an outside school or to explore this opportunity. So I called Dr. Ringo up um, and I said, I'm ready. And so that's how I went into his office. Yeah. Tell us what, the, what the, the duties and responsibilities were. Sir. All was right. That, that was a half time or a full time appointment? Uh, it was sort of a half time right. appointment, but it doesn't Eventually. matter. I was yeah. always there. Sure. Um, I think by now it was 1995, right. January 1, when I started, started mid-year. Um, 
the first two weeks that I was there, or first 10 days, um, my office was not ready, so Bob Ringo was on vacation, and he asked me to use his office. So you have to imagine this kid. I've been in his office, so I you know. know. Trying to use his office, and I felt so out of place, um, trying to use his office. Um, by then, he already had a full slate of his social proposals. He had filled the job that he offered me two years prior. So I was actually a third person. I think he took me on uh, because I think he really wanted me to have the opportunity as an associate provost. Um, and so my projects then became much more interesting, and that is they're not the projects where you have to get done every day to keep the place going. They were more creative projects. So my projects were on strategic planning. It was on the continuous improvement Excellence 21. It was about changing culture, preparing for tomorrow. Uh, there was a new reinvestment program where we try to take money of today and apply it to new investment programs. So my tasks and duties were not the type of things that academic institutions have to do year in and year out, but much more creative and unstructured. Um, to uh, So those were my assignments. And it was very interesting because they were not done much before then. So I sort of have to invent how I would do it. And also the other thing was I started January 1, which is probably January 4th or something like that. And Dr. Ringo on January 18th, I believe that was his birthday, also found out that his older son has stage 3 cancer. Um, and he was such a family man. He loved his family so much. I think that that was the first real big challenge in Bob's life. And it happened, you know, in my first month there and on his birthday. So our next two years, I mean, um, you know, the Bob dealing with the worry um, of his son's cancer and uh, also bringing me on board, they happened at the same time but he was an incredible mentor. He gave me projects I've never done before. Um, and so long as I think things through, I bring to him and say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, this is what I think should be done, and he'll give me feedback. Uh, th this will work, this may not work, be really careful, watch out for this and that. There were people on campus who found him very difficult to work with, not for me at all. I, absolutely appreciate it, that candor. Yes. He's a, well, I, I worked with him because I got to know him when I started doing the database searching and I continued on. Even when he was over there, he used to have somebody call, so, you know. Uh, and then we moved on. Do you want to make any comments on that, how that came about, and where you're currently at? Oh, goes in, I right? moved on. Yes. Um, I was very, very happy at Purdue. I loved my job um, at Hufti. I loved working with Bob Ringo. He taught me so much. And also with Dr. Beering and Dr. Ford. They were very good teachers. Yes. They treated me very well. Uh, Bob, at that point, started taking me to the CIC meetings of the provost. I think in his mind, he always wanted to show me the world, the provost. Um, and uh, my children were big Purdue fans. We were very happy. I think if John Purdue had a daughter, it would be me. <laughs> um, and uh, out of the blue, I got a phone call from Notre Dame, and that was 1996. Notre Dame had actually called around 1992 and 93 um, to ask me to um, become a candidate for their chair in entrepreneurship, and I turned it down. 1996, there was a new provost at that point, Nathan Hatch. And he called me and he said, we're looking for the dean of business and people say I should really speak to you. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I'm perfectly happy here, you know, and um, I just want to stay here. He said, well, never mind. Let me come and visit you. You don't have to do anything. You just have to have breakfast with me. And uh, he came, and I think that was in June. In July, Bob Ringo had supported me to go to Harvard for a three-week program. Um, during that three-week program, there were probably six people or so, either from Notre Dame or were alumni of Notre Dame. 
Um, and afterwards, because that was a tight group, those three weeks together, they would invite me to Notre Dame just for a reunion, informal reunion. And so I accepted. So now it is fall of 1996. Um, someone found out I was coming for dinner, and the search committee for the deanship said, oh, since you're going to be here, would you meet with us? And I said, I would meet with you, but not as your candidate. Um, if you want to talk about MBA program, I've run one of those. Um, and I also know what Catholic education is about because I was a product of Catholic education from 1 through 12. And, you know, I believe Catholic education gave me my start. Um, so <laughs> I said, okay, so I'd be happy to talk with you, but I'm not your dean. So I came in and actually it was one of those game day Friday where instead of taking two and a half hours, it took four hours to get from uh, West Lafayette to South Bend. And I was so late. The committee was waiting for me, and they disbanded and then waited for my call and then came back to, you know, reconvened. And I just gave them very honest sort of feedback. And again, I'm a strategist. To everything, I put on a strategist hat and say, I think you should do this. I think you should not do that. And they asked me point blank, do you think a Catholic business school would be taken seriously in the world of business. And I said, I wouldn't understand why it would not. You know, I said, uh, uh, being Catholic, you know, represents a certain values orientation. Um, you would approach business, I think, actually, with much stronger ethical foundation. And why would that not be acceptable to business? Even though popular culture may think that, you know, we leave religion on Sunday at the church or that, you know, good guys don't win or they come back last or whatever. I said, you don't believe that. And you need to take your belief and show that why that is a model to succeed in every sector, including business. And I deeply believe in that, really. And I just thought, that is kind of a strange question. Um, after that, they would not leave me alone. So that was the beginning. They actually said, nobody has ever said that, that uh, a Catholic business school will not only be taken seriously, but could win. So that was the beginning of my work. Okay, and then you, get, and you left there, right? Okay, now you've gotten some awards. Let's talk about uh, a couple of awards. But the Order of Griffin they got from Purdue, and that uh, the Salvo Noren Award for the Outstanding Teacher when you were at, at Purdue. You know, awards, I don't know if it's about sort of the recipient, about the generosity of the people who love you. Um, and so there's a lot of grace, there's a lot of generosity in those. The Order of the Griffin was very touching to me. When I had to tell, when I finally decided to go to Notre Dame, and it was a strange sort of decision. I actually didn't quite interview. I actually accepted the job before there were terms I was concerned that if I come back and came back and talked to Dr. Ringo, I would never leave. Um, I just could not, would not be able to leave. But I also understood that I was leaving not so much for a better job or more pay or whatever it is, that I was working on a mission. And it was very clear that that mission was my mission, the combination of values, faith, and business education. So I accepted all of those things, and I had to tell someone. It was Thanksgiving was approaching, and this was now 1996 Thanksgiving. And I didn't want to tell Bob before Thanksgiving. His family was coming in for Thanksgiving. His son was dealing with his cancer treatment. I thought he didn't need this from me. So I really sort of buckled down and try to avoid anyone before Thanksgiving vacation so that I don't have to s say anything. So Bob finally left, and I think it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, Wednesday before the Thursday. Mm -hmm. Dr. Beering started walking around the office to wish everybody Happy Thanksgiving. I came into my office to wish me Happy Thanksgiving. It give you a sense, too, of what type of a boss he was. And by then, I think I was so relieved and, and my guard was down. I was probably a bit sad, you know, knowing that after Thanksgiving I have to share this news. He came in and he said, Happy Thanksgiving, and I hope you have a really good one. And I started crying. 
And I still remember what he said. He said, oh, he said, what's wrong? He said, you know, there's a doctor in the house and he has Kleenex, you know. So I laughed and I cried at the same time. I went to his office. I told him what it was about. I said, Dr. Bering, I have to leave for this reason. And I said, as you know, I'm not leaving because I'm not happy or this is something better. I'm leaving because I really felt like this was a call. Um, it was my vocation. And he immediately understood. Uh, he told me how he felt like God directed him different points in his life. That there were occasions that he would have died if not for the intervention of God. And that the way his life worked out, he felt like God was always with him. Um, and so he said it was really sad to see me go, but he wanted to help me in every way possible. Then he pulled out his Bible and he read two passages to me. Um, and then so it really sort of helped me a bit. And then, and of course, after break, I had to talk to Dr. Wingo. So during commencement of that year, Dr. Bering, actually, you know, these ceremonies, all of a sudden he began the ceremony and he said, you know, I know that Carolyn Wu is among the faculty and I would ask her to stand. You know, and that was, I had never, it never happened before that. At that point, he thanked me and he made me a member of the Order of Griffin. At that point, there were only eight people who have received that award, and it included Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon and the last man on the moon, too. And it's a, a, an award for service and for courage. It was deeply moving to me. Um, and actually, after that, he actually nominated me to serve with him on a corporate board. So when you talk about grace and generosity and letting people go, um, that award said everything. I don't know whether I've d done enough to deserve that award, but I recognize the love and the support that my first year at, uh, in my new job at Notre Dame, Bob Ringo had told me that any time I needed help, just called him. And I did. And he would have things faxed to me right away. He came to visit with me. Uh, he came to also meet with Father Hesburgh. And sort of like, you know, like they're giving away a daughter, but they're sticking right behind me. That's nice. The first Notre That's Dame. Bob's style. Yeah, the first Notre Dame Purdue game. It was at Purdue. And the president and Bob welcomed me back, you know, of course, with the Notre Dame brass, and uh, made it very clear that, I, you know, I was an honored guest. So even after I left, they worked so hard to make sure that I was properly settled. Very, that's nicely said, that really is nice. Now you also got the uh, John S. Day Distinguished Alumni Academic Service Award. That's a nice, that's nice. Yes, that's also, you know, the Salvo Noren Award is nice because it recognizes teaching in the classroom. Right. And the John S. Day Award means a lot, too, as a distinguished alumnus. And though I left um, and went to another business school, the fact that a Cranard I still sort of acknowledge that journey that I was on, uh, again, there was a lot of grace. And John Day, of course, was dean when I was a student. So that meant a lot to Yeah, that's right, exactly. Okay. Um, professional associations, one of the ACSB International, you're, the, you're still the chair of that? No, I was the chair. Okay. Um, you are chair for one year. Mm -hmm. So I was the chair, I believe, in, nine, in 2004. And uh, that's another one of those things that um, I can't quite explain it. I became a dean, of course, and AACSB is the American Association for Collegiate mm -hmm. School Business. It's the accreditation agency um, for business schools. And I became active in it. I think just in my third year, they nominated me to chair this association, which was kind of unbelievable, third or fourth year. And then you go through, first of all, as chair-elect, and then chair, and then past chair. Um, and I was a very new dean, or, you know, people who become chair of AACSB, they generally have served 10, 15, 20 years in their post. So when I was nominated, so I would say that was 2002, 
Uh, I, so I was active the three years before then. So I only really had three or four years working with AACSB. I had never actually at that point done an accreditation. Um, and uh, so again, there was a lot of generosity. So I accepted the nomination um, and, um, you know, and then moved on to become chair. Sure, that's very nice. Uh, do you have a, a new author who came for old masters? And your honorary doctorates, University of St. Francis in Providence. That's very nice. And you've been on some boards and things. Uh, do you have a, still have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I just remembered it. I have many Purdue traditions, actually. A lot of family traditions where we would go to Mass every Sunday at St. Tom's and afterwards come over to the Purdue Memorial Union. And once a week, I allowed myself the luxury of having fried eggplants. I bet they could probably sort of clog your arteries, but that was such a treat. Uh, but my favorite actually was every April, um, I would take a walk um, to the golf course, the south course. And the reason was that April was my birthday. Um, and campus was so beautiful. All the flowering trees would just burst into blossoms. Um, and I remember my first year, I was very homesick. Um, and I took that walk, and I became less homesick. Um, instead of just um, thinking of home, I was beginning to get a sense that this is really now my home, um, and, uh, and that I was on a journey that was a privileged journey of learning. Uh, I think by then I had gotten my uh, uh, a fellowship notification. So, uh, so that April walk uh, around campus, was always special to me. And so it was just April last month, and I thought, boy, I could really sort of do a walk at <laughs> Purdue. Right, good. How about an outstanding event? You can have, I, when I say that, sometimes they yeah. say, well, you can have more than one. I, I would say the outstanding event in my life was when I was tapped for mortarboard. Um, I, was, I had finished my second year, which, you know, because I did my work in three years, it's hard to count. Um, I was active in the church at St. Tom's. I was very active at St. Tom's, but I wasn't active in a Greek system. I clearly was not in a Greek system. And even student government here, I was not as active, I think, probably because in my first year here, I didn't have time to be involved in student government. And I actually didn't feel like I belonged. Like if you were a foreigner, you know, a foreign student, um, there's a lot of cultural things to learn and a sense of belonging and a sense of ease with any group. I didn't feel any of those. So my activity was always the church. Um, and because I, was, I had so many credit hours, I just made more and more of my activities at the church. So I was never sort of in peace sub or whatever, or in the Greek system. Um, but I was just doing my things at St. Tom's. I didn't even know what mortarboard was, uh, but you know, there was one day at the dorm, and I'm never at the dorm because I'm always in the library, but I happened to be in a dorm after dinner that night. And there was this group of people who bursted in and presented a rose, and before I knew I was tapped <laughs> for mortarboard. And Kathy, uh -huh. I would just say, that change, um, you know, that was just after two years at Purdue. Um, that all of a sudden, I may have never seen myself as a leader or um, I was just a very good student, uh, and I worked a lot at St. Tom's just because that was sort of home to me. Um, so that first honor was the first leadership honor that I've ever received. Um, and it changed the way that I, I looked at myself in the American culture. Good point, good point. Um, a look ahead, the career path for graduates, uh, business schools, any comment on the 21st century? Um, sure. A lot of people now are criticizing uh, graduate business schools, and explicitly the criticism is always that people are greedy who go into business schools. And the implicit criticism is that there's not enough content or rigor to merit. It's more sort of like finishing school for people who want to make a lot of money. Um, I completely disagree. I think that if we look at the last 20 years, business has gotten so complex, you know, because of globalization, new regulation, 
technology has driven so many changes and markets are so huge um, that actually the, the education part of it has gone through major revolutions, is very rigorous, um, the way that we prepare students to understand these complex issues. I also think that business schools do not encourage our students to be greedy. Uh, there may be a few schools where going into Wall Street and making tons of money becomes so much a value system that students just internalize it. But I don't believe our education encourage people to be greedy. But I think where MBA education, business education, has not done well is it hasn't given a vision of big purpose. It has not encouraged our students to take a look at society's problems and how business can be a solution to those problems and therefore how they as eventual business leaders could be the solutions. I think if there's any failure, it's a failure of inspiration, it's a failure of imagination. Mm. Uh, any, any closing and anything further or something I forgot to ask? Um, no, I think that in the end what I would say is that I have encountered so many generous people at Purdue University. So many people gave a hand up, up for me. Um, my mentors, my teachers, Arnie Cooper, Dan Shendo, uh, Gordy Wright who passed on. Uh, you know, education is by nature a very generous profession. Right. Good point. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank, Thank you, you very much for this.